want to be uh, clear about the last name in that we are not anonymous from each other. That's actually a, a bastardization that's happened over the years. That's not to suggest that uh, being Bob G or uh, you know Susan L is problematic. Uh, although, just so you know, Bill Wilson uh, was only Bill W to the outside world. He was Bill Wilson to the people within the rooms. Uh, so I want to be clear that I am. Uh, I am uh, in recovery, and I'm a member of a variety of recovery programs, but for, for our purposes, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, and uh, to, to open up the meeting, I'd like to, have, I'd like to recruit you into a, a short dialogue about what is wrong with Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, what's gone wrong with Alcoholics Anonymous? What's not working in Alcoholics Anonymous? What's gone awry? Uh, and I, I understand that what I've just done is present a theory which is that something's awry in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so I, I feel compelled to back up that theory with some data. Uh, and the data can, can be found in our recovery rates, uh, which you can get, you know, you, you can call into an uh, intergroup and world, worldwide services and get numbers on our recovery rate. So the data to back up the theory that something's not working in Alcoholics Anonymous is the fact that for the first 25 years of Alcoholics Anonymous, when, uh, over which time the program was worked uh, according to the paradigm put together uh, by our co-founders uh, and, uh, and our pioneers. Uh, so using uh, the steps being worked with the cadence that they originally set up, for the first 25 years, our recovery rates were astonishing. Astonishing. Uh, our recovery rates for the last 25 years have done nothing but plummet downward. Uh, and are currently in the toilet. We've never had so many people coming into these rooms. We've never had so few people getting well. Uh, and while there may be a variety of factors, in fact, I'm quite sure there are a variety of factors uh, included in, to explain why that's happened. To cover the main one, what I firmly believe, what we firmly believe is the main reason, uh, I, I want to share with you a, a metaphor that I think will be useful. Um, that metaphor is the metaphor of a uh, tightrope walker, right? So if, if you'd allow me to recruit you into this metaphor, picture yourself for a moment at a circus and watching uh, this <coughs> professional tightrope walker. Uh, and you're watching them and you're reveling in, in this routine they're putting on. Uh, I would ask if we can all get on board with the idea that if you were watching a tightrope walker, regardless of which tightrope walker it was or what circus you were at, I think there's two things you definitely would find. One is the, the big pole they use to balance. And the second one is down beneath them would be a very large net. Right? These are two things you could count on. So what I'm curious is, do you sense that if you were watching this tightrope walker, that you'd tell yourself that the main element that allows them to stay on the rope without falling is the net. <clears throat> Do you sense that the fact that there's a net there is the main thing keeping them up on the wire? I'm curious. Anybody? Probably not, right? Now, that's not to suggest the net isn't a factor. The net might well be giving them a certain level of confidence. So it's very possible the net has something to do with them being able to stay up on the wire and do the routine. What I'm curious about is, what do you think the main component is? I'm curious what you think the main thing keeping them up on that wire is. Anybody have a guess? Their own skill. Their own skill, yes. Balance. Focus. Balance, focus. Practice. Say again? Practice. Practice. That seems like a big one. Training. Fearless. Say again? Fearless. Perhaps they are fearless. It's interesting that you're mentioning fearless, because that's going to come up in our, in our fourth and fifth step tonight. Uh, say again? Bravado. Perhaps, perhaps a Rovato. It seems to me training and practice are probably the key words. My guess is, my personal guess is, what's allowing them to stay on the wire and complete this routine is the fact that over a course of time, they engaged in a series of actions to learn how to do this. And it has allowed them to achieve this balance that you're watching. Right? They may have some innate talent for it, but ultimately they've taken a they've engaged in a series of actions and practice to be able to attain the balance that you're watching. Now, if I can extend the metaphor 
and you'll bear with me for a moment, into the idea that picture the wire, the tightrope, as life. And a person's ability to successfully go across the tightrope as a human, ability, uh, a human being's ability to successfully navigate life. And the net as the support system that a human being has. The people who have their back, hopefully in a healthy way, because it's, it's very easy to have people having your back in an unhealthy way, right? To have a series of caretakers in your life. Caretaker, different word than caregiver, right? And if you don't know the difference, a caretaker is someone, the caretaker actually takes away the ability of the person to take care of themselves. A caregiver freely gives care, right? So I would offer that the alcoholic in this metaphor is someone who continually falls off the wire. An alcoholic is someone who's just always falling off the wire. They're not very good at this, right? What's worse, they either have no support system, or if they have a support system, chances are it's a toxic one, which is another way of saying they have no net. So not only are they continually falling off the wire, but when they do, it hurts. They get damaged, wounded. And by the time they come to a place like this, they tend to be pretty banged up, in a lot of pain, because they've spent a lot of time falling off the wire and smacking into the ground. When our program does what it's supposed to do, I would offer that when they come into us, that there's two things we need to tell them. The first one is, and here's the main one, we are going to teach you how to stay on the wire. We're going to teach you here how to successfully navigate the wire. That's the main thing we're going to do for you. The other thing we're going to do is give you a net. So when you do occasionally fall off the wire, it'll hurt less. Right? The net is the support system of Alcoholics Anonymous, the fellowship. Right? So we have two key things going on in Alcoholics Anonymous. We have a fellowship and we have a program. The net is the fellowship. The fellowship are the meetings we go to, the stories people tell, the friends you make, the coffee, the cookies, 90 meetings in 90 days, call your sponsor every day. These are all products of our fellowship. Uh, much like the net, they're not what's going to get you well. They're not what's going to keep you up on the rope. But they're there to support you while you learn to navigate the rope. Learning to navigate the rope is our program. The place we get well. The directions to successfully navigate your life. And the steps are laid out in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. This book, right? This is our basic text. We've nicknamed it the Big Book. Uh, I, I say that because if you go to a literature table looking to buy a book called the Big Book, there's not one, right? That's the nickname for the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. In here are the steps and the directions for how to work the steps. The first 164 pages of this book are the program. And I would offer that the main reason that our numbers have dropped off so precipitously is because these days people don't come in and get the program. Or if they do, they don't get it right away. What they're going to get first is a ton of fellowship. Right? So they're going to walk into our rooms and they're going to hear things like, just stay sober and go to meetings. Take your time. There's no rush. Get a hot cup of coffee. Come back every day. Don't pick up. Get a slew of phone numbers. Call your sponsor every day. Do a 90 and 90. It's the equivalent of telling someone who's just come to tightrope walking school, here's how it works. Climb up the ladder, just get on the rope. If you fall, there's a net. Now, if they told you that at tightrope walking school, it would seem what you'd do is a lot of falling. Right? When you fell, it might not hurt quite as much as it did in the past. But you're still going to do a lot of falling. And if you're doing nothing but falling, sooner or later, you're probably going to come to one of two conclusions. Either A, I'm really bad at this, or B, they don't know what they're doing. If someone comes into AA and gets no program, they just get a lot of fellowship, what we've given them is a net. So they keep relapsing, they keep falling over. They may have found a nice landing pad in here. This might be a place where after they've fallen off the wire, they can come in and get a lot of head rubbing. 
But sooner or later, they're probably going to decide either A, I can't do this, or B, they don't know what they're doing and they can't help me. And then they go out and they drink and they die. And that's what's happening to most of the people coming into AA these days, which is why we're not getting anybody well. The point of sessions like these are to get you the message in the book. That's what I'm here to talk to you about, the message in the book, not my message. So I wouldn't encourage you to leave here and say, Michael Mark told me. I mean, I am going to tell you some things. But the things I'm going to tell you come from our basic text. They're facts. They're not my opinions. You don't want Michael's message. Michael's message nearly killed Michael. I'm quite sure it'll kill you. The message in the book will probably save your life. Considering that up until about 70 years ago, for hundreds and thousands of years, there was no answer for people like us. You know, if you crossed whatever imaginary line there was into alcoholism, you were charbroiled. You weren't getting better. There was no better. People really didn't say alcoholism and recovery in the same sentence. Right? For the last 70 years, a little more than that, we've actually had a solution. The solutions in the book, that's the solution you need to know about. You need to know what's available to you and you need to know the way in which it's available to you, and then you can do what you want with it. So tonight is session two of the four weeks. So tonight we're going to talk about steps four and five. This is where the work begins. This is also where we tend to lose people. Can anyone else identify with that? Right? Because up till now, it's kind of not that hard. I'm not suggesting that walking into AA is not a big deal. I'm not suggesting that doing the first three steps is not a big deal. It's a big deal. But most people can do it. You know, you walk into the rooms, and what's not to like? Everyone's nice. Everyone's giving you phone numbers and hugging you. There's free coffee on. Right? Do the first step. Can you accept what your problem is? Yeah, I can accept that. Good. Second step. Can you accept what the solution to your problem is? Absolutely, I can accept that. Third step. Can you make an affirmative declaration? Sure, I can make a declaration. Fourth step. Make a comprehensive list of your resentments, your fears, your harms done others, and then they're gone. But the reality is, we don't really begin to change until the fourth step. The first three steps are the preparation steps. They're the preparation for the change. The change happens in the work. The work is steps four through nine. That's the program of recovery. One, two, and three prepare us for the work. 10, 11, and 12 is where we maintenance and grow what we get out of the work which is recovery. So last week, just to catch you up if you're here for the first time, in step one, we took a look at the first chapter in the book, which is the, actually the chapter before chapter one, called The Doctor's Opinion, and care of Dr. William Duncan Silkworth, one of the foremost experts on alcoholism in the country, if not in the world, at that time. We found out, or at least as good a description as you're ever going to get, what an alcoholic is, mainly so that you could diagnose yourself. Do I have this thing? What's an alcoholic? Am I one? Right? And we found out that an alcoholic is someone who has a physical allergy to alcohol, which means that they've had the experience of losing track of their drinking, of having their drinking get away from them. They've had the experience of planning to have two drinks and gone and had four, or planning to have four drinks and having 27, depending on the situation. Right. But they can't always guarantee you what they're going to drink. That's the physical allergy to alcohol. And that that physical allergy is compounded by what's described as a mental obsession, which means that when we're not drinking, quickly or slowly, we will become restless, irritable, and discontent. Fancy way of saying can't live in your own skin. Sooner or later, that will become painful enough that we'll reach for the only thing we know that will quell the pain, which is a drink, so trigger the physical allergy again. And boom, we're off to the races. Physical allergy giving way to mental obsession, giving way to physical allergy. That's the cycle of addiction, of alcoholism. In the second step, we found out what the solution to that problem is. Power greater than human power. Higher power. Right? We talked about the idea that all you need to do to do the second step is be willing to believe that there's a power greater than yourself. You do not need to know who or what your higher power is to do the second step. You just need to be able to say, yeah, I believe there's a power greater than myself, or it's possible for me to believe that there's a power greater than myself. Good. That's your second step. Now you know what your problem is and what the solution to your problem is. The third step says, based on your understanding of the problem and the solution, K 
can you now make an affirmative declaration that you're ready to get to work, to do whatever it takes to bring the solution to light? And then we made that declaration as a room. So for those of you who were here last week, you watched us go through one, two, and three. You yourselves went through one, two, and three and became ready for four by the time you left here at the end of the hour. Right? That goes back to Bob, Bill, our first 100, and many, many, many who came after them. Right? This simplistic program that we have complicated the hell out of. All right, so today, today we get down to the work. Right? This is where the work begins. This is step four. This is the beginning of the action steps. Now, if you'd like to follow along, you certainly don't have to. Um, we're going to begin on pages uh, 63 and 64. Um, this is uh, the chapter called How It Works, which is where we left off last time around. Step four reads, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. The principle of the fourth step is courage. We talked about this last time around, that all of the steps have a principle associated with them. Does anyone remember what step one was? Truth. Truth. Step two? Hope. Hope. Step three? Faith. Faith. So the principle for step four is courage. Courage. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And the fact that the principle is courage is actually quite important. Someone over there when we were talking about the tightrope walk mentioned fearless, right? Okay. Um, so it's important that we get a beat on what the word fearless means. Because the word seems like it should mean what? What does fearless seem like it should mean? Without fear. Without fear. It does seem like fearless should mean without fear. Now, if you come into AA and you believe that fearless means without fear and that upon the precipice of the fourth step you should be fearless, then that means that as you're about to start the fourth step, you should not be what? Afraid. Afraid. You should not be afraid. Does anyone think that might be a problem for the average person coming into AA? Mm -hmm. I was scared to death every day. Right? So it seems to me that if you believe fearless, it means it's supposed to mean without fear, that you could very easily come to the conclusion, wow, I'm really doing this wrong. Fearless doesn't mean without fear. Fearless, at least for our purposes and the way it's being used in the steps and in the book, means the courage to walk through fear. The courage to walk through fear. That's why the principle is courage. Fearless tells us you're going to be scared, and you're going to do it anyway. You're going to be scared, but you're going to do it anyway. Does that, does that feel to anybody like a new way to navigate fear? That's not my experience with fear. My experience is I'm scared. I go that way or hide. I don't walk through fear. That seems like the last thing I want to do with fear is walk toward it. But that's what fearless means. So searching and fearless moral inventory means that in a fourth step, we are going to search inside of ourselves. And as we search inside of ourselves, the chances are great that we'll be scared of what we find. But we're going to face it anyway. We're going to be fearless about what we find when we search inside ourselves. Okay. So on page 63, this is the last paragraph now on page 63. Um, I may have mentioned this before. Something that, the, that this particular book is chock full of, there are two things it's chock full of, directions and warnings. So there's a lot of data in the book that explains to you exactly what you ought to do, what you must do if you want to get well, if you want to recover. There's also a whole lot of data that will explain to you what to avoid doing if you don't want to sabotage your recovery. So page four, uh, excuse me, step four on page 63 begins with a direction. So you've done steps one, two, and three, right? We want to know what we're going to do next. So the paragraph begins with next, here's exactly what we do. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action. We launched out on a course of vigorous action. That course of vigorous action is steps four through nine. That's the course of vigorous action, right? And how does it tell us to take on this course of vigorous action? Launch out. I mean, that, that's a pretty major expression. Launch. 
It doesn't say we considered a course of vigorous action, or we gave some serious thought to a course of vigorous action, or we sort of chilled out, patted ourselves on the back for doing steps one, two, and three, and waited a while before starting a course of vigorous action. We launched out on a course of vigorous action. So the directions seem to be pretty clear. This is something you do immediately. Upon starting steps one, two, and three, you launch out on a course of vigorous action. The first step of which, so the first step in that course of vigorous action is in a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Right? So this is not step one of the 12, but step four is step one in the course of vigorous action. Right? Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, does anybody know what decision they're talking about? Third step. The third step decision. Though our, so this is something the book does commonly, which is that a new step will begin, and at the beginning of that step, they will refer you back to the step that preceded it. Right? So though our decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, our third step decision, was vital, life-giving, and crucial, very important. Right? So it was a big deal that we did that. Though it was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect, which means it'll wear off, unless, how quickly? At once. At once followed. Now they've told us a second time. Launched out on a course of vigorous action, right? And whatever glimpse you got of God, whatever <clears throat> feeling you got of recovery from the first three steps, it will go away unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking Right. So the directions couldn't be clearer on the rapidity with which we do these steps, on the cadence which we, with which we take these steps. Um, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. Our liquor was but a symptom, so alcohol is not the problem. Alcohol is a manifestation of the problem. This is what we learned in the first step. Your problem is not alcohol. Your problem is, who remembers? What's our dilemma? Lack of power is our dilemma, right? So your problem is not booze. Your problem is not you. Your problem is lack of power. If you're powerless, you're missing power, right? So our liquor is but a symptom. We have to get down to causes and conditions, which is another way of saying patterns. We're looking for the patterns of our failure. So it goes on to say, therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. That's what we're doing in the fourth step a personal inventory, I'm doing an inventory of my insides, if you will. This was step four. A business, and they're gonna create a metaphor now that I actually really like, a business, so they're gonna, they're gonna compare our personal inventory to a professional inventory, a corporate inventory, a business inventory. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. That means the same thing as searching and fearless. Fact-finding and fact-facing. We're going to search inside of ourselves and be fearless about what we find. We're going on a fact-finding mission, and when we find those facts, we're going to face them fearlessly. Right? So taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It's an effort to discover the truth about the stock in trade. So, Potentially to simplify this, let me share a piece of experience, strength, and hope with you in terms of uh, a business inventory, a professional inventory. Um, my first job, I grew up in North Jersey, and I'm going to say I was 15, 16. My first job was at CVS. Uh, they hired me as a clerk, cash register person. Right? Um, what I remember most about CVS is that every other week on Sunday, they would have us come in early. I think we opened at like 8, but they'd have us come in. All the workers had to come in like 5.30 or 6. And everyone would get a clipboard and a piece of paper with all this stuff on it and a pencil, right? And we had to wander through the store and write down and check off everything in the store, how much we had of everything. That was the, the point of inventory. I hated it, hated it, and was quite sure that there was no point to it no utility to doing it. I mean, I actually remember walking around doing it thinking, there's no point to this. Now, if you asked me to back up that theory, 
Why is there no point to this? I would have told you because from my place at the cash register, the way the store was laid out, from my place at the cash register, I could see 95% of the store, which means I can see the truth from the cash register. I don't need to come in 5.30. I can see how much we have of everything, other than like the pharmacy, which was like way in the back. <laughs> I could see everything else. Now, hypothetically, let's say they just turned the store over to me and I ran it that way. Right? So let's say there's like a random day and I get a call from downstairs from the you know, warehouse. And they say, how are we doing on uh, Pampers? We've got to see if we need to order any. Right? And I, Pampers are right there, aisle five. Right? I look down aisle five and the Pampers are sort of flush up to the front. And I say, no, we're, we have plenty. Hang up. Now, if you've ever had this kind of job, you often have to do something that's called facing. Does everyone know what that is? <laughs> right? You've got to push everything up to the front of the shelves flush so it looks like you have enough. Right? So in reality, I don't really know how many Pampers we have. I've, just, I've made an assumption. Right? Let's say they call later in the day and they say, how are we doing on Tylenol? Now, Tylenol is actually back by the pharmacy. I can't see the Tylenol from where I am. But I think to myself, I was, I was there yesterday. I remember going back there to get someone some Tylenol. And there, there was a lot. Nah, we're good. Now, if I continue to run my store this way, sooner or later, my store will be in shambles. Well, that's what happened to me. And most of us, for a long time, I thought I could see the truth about myself from the register, as it were. Turned out, little by little, my store was collapsing underneath me. And by the time I got to you people, I was in shambles. So in terms of doing the fourth step, one way to think about it is it's time to get a clipboard and a pencil and take a look at what's going on in here. Not to mention, if you went a year without doing an inventory in your store, the inventory would probably take a little while and perhaps be a bit painful and uncomfortable. It's no different with this inventory. right? Now at CVS, the goal was to find out what was going on with the Pampers and the Tylenol. Right? That was the data I needed to collect in a business inventory. In a personal inventory, in this fourth step inventory, what's the data we need to collect? The book is now going to tell us. So if you look at page 64, uh, the last paragraph now on page 64, we're going to find out that a proper fourth step is composed of three elements. Three elements. The first one, which really is the driving force of the fourth step, mm -hmm. you're going to find on the last paragraph on page 64. It says resentment, resentment, that's the word we're going to deal with here, is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. So resentment destroys more alcoholics than Johnny Walker Black. Resentment destroys more alcoholics than Heineken. Right? It's the number one offender. So it's, it's obviously a big word. It's probably important that we know what the word means. So here's what the word means. The word resent, the prefix re, R-E, means to do again. To do again. Sent or sentiment comes from a Latin root centauri, which means quite literally to feel. So resentment means to feel again, to refeel. So let's talk about how a resentment shows up in a human being, right? Let's say, hypothetically, I have a friend named uh, Steve. <laughs> Steve's a good buddy of mine, and this is back when I'm still drinking. And one night, I'm at a party with Steve and a bunch of other people. And at some point during the party, we're all standing around with a cocktail. And me and Steve and four other guys are in a circle. And we're talking and we're chatting and we're making each other laugh and we're updating each other. And perhaps in the midst of our interaction, uh, there's a little bit of uh, uh, playfulness with each other in terms of insults, etc. And at some point during the merriment, Steve makes a comment about me. Steve takes a shot at me in an effort to be funny about something that I told Steve in confidence. Okay? Does everyone get where I am now? This is the setup. Okay? Now, if that situation took place today, it would be pretty easily dealt with. For me, in that at some point later in the evening or the next day, I would find Steve, 
and I would have a conversation with him. And I'd say something like, listen, Steve, you know, you're my buddy, we got a lot in common, we, we watch baseball together, but I, I need to be able to trust you. Uh, and what you said last night in Nick's company was really inappropriate and really hurt my feelings. I don't want to carry it around. I don't want it to get in the way of our relationship. So I'd like to have a dialogue about it so we can put it to rest and process it. I had no ability to have that kind of conversation with somebody when I was still out there. right? So what I probably would have done, put in that exact situation, probably is nothing probably nothing, or worse, I would have laughed along with everybody else. Right? It would have made more sense to me to laugh at my own pain rather than risk a potentially challenging conversation with a friend. Right? Now here's what's really interesting. At the end of the evening, Steve is going to go on his way and forget what he said. Not me. Not me. Every time I see Steve after that evening, I'm going to refeel that situation. Does that make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm going to feel again because it's been unprocessed. I haven't dealt with it. I've just buried it. Right? So every time I see Steve after that evening, I'm going to refeel what occurred. What's even more interesting, potentially, is that I don't even need Steve to process the resentment. Right? So it's like there's a little tape recorder that's now gotten placed inside of me with a recording of what Steve said. Every time I see Steve's face, play gets pushed. But what's even more interesting is that, let's say it's a month later, and I'm with John, different friend, different situation, different group of people. And John says something that upsets me or hurts my feelings. It's very possible that what John said will trigger what Steve had said. And then my reaction to it may be out of proportion because I'm sort of being hit doubly. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? Now, because I don't know how to process my feelings, I probably won't deal with John either, which is going to put a second little tape recorder inside of me, getting triggered by other people. Right? Now, you live that way for potentially decades, as many of us do. By the time you get to a place like this, picture hundreds of these little tape recorders inside of you, constantly being triggered by friends, family, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, teachers, principals, bosses, coworkers. It's a lot of noise in your head. History has shown, my own experience has shown, alcohol deadens that noise, silences that noise beautifully. It works. That's why we use it, because it works. Alcohol did what I wanted it to do every time I wanted it to do it. Until one day, what? Stopped. Stopped dead. That's the one thing I didn't know about alcohol. That it was going to stop working. It worked. It absolutely worked. That first party where that kid Marty came out my freshman year and held out a beer to me, and I took it from him and guzzled it down and realized that 14 years of fear had evaporated in one can of liquid. It worked. And it worked the next time. And the 10 times after that, and the 50 times after that, but one day, without warning, my medicine stopped silencing the screams in my head and began making them louder. And I had no idea that was going to happen. Okay, so we've got to get to the bottom of our resentments. Questions about that? Nothing? Okay. Take a look now at page 67, second full paragraph. So we're going to be looking at our resentments. Now, in the second full paragraph on 67, it says, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done. So our resentments are about the wrongs we perceive anyway that others have done. People who hurt me, people who shamed me, people who ignored me, people who pissed me off, what have you. Now we're putting that out of our minds, and we're going to resolutely look at our own mistakes. 
right? So after looking, I'm going to look at the way in which people harmed me. Now I'm going to be looking at the way in which I harmed people. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person entirely. Where were we to blame? We're looking at our stuff now. Further, look at the last paragraph on 67. Go to the second sentence in that paragraph. Now they're going to tell us we're also going to be looking at our fear. So now we have a third component. It says this short word, that being fear, somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. They don't use these words lightly. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances Brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve, but did not we ourselves set the ball rolling. Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with ceiling. It seems to cause more trouble. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. The point the book is making here is that some of the things we fear, we resent, and some of the things we resent, we fear. But they're not always going to be the same things. So there probably will be some overlap. But we now know the three major components we're looking at in a proper fourth step are our resentments, our fears, and our harms done others, the way in which we've hurt other people. Questions about any of that? OK. So now we come to the question of format. Now that we know what data we're looking for in the fourth step, what format do we use to get it all down on paper? OK. Uh, two, two points about format. The first one, there is no right, one right way to do a fourth step. There are endless ways to do a fourth step. Okay? Further, what's most important about a fourth step is not the format. It's not that the format has no importance, but the format is by far not the most important part of your fourth step. And there's a variety of different ways you can choose to do it. Okay, now, if you look at page 65 in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to find a suggestion on how to do a fourth step. One way to do a fourth step. Okay? Uh, this is not, in fact, the way that I'm going to go through with you. And if that brings up the question, why are you now deviating from the big book? Because this really is the only time in these four sessions that we will specifically, purposefully deviate away from what's in the big book. Uh, I'd like to give you a, a real quick bit of AA history so that you understand why this choice is being made, because it's not a random choice. Okay? Um, the big book was written primarily by one person that person being Bill Wilson. He's the primary author of the big book. Though it was compiled by a variety of people. There were about 100 people in Alcoholics Anonymous when the book was being put together. It was mainly written by Bill, but it was compiled by a bunch of people. Further, the book was not necessarily written in a hurry, but to some extent it was compiled in a hurry. Basically what happened is, Bill had written all the chapters, and they were sort of all over the place. And the chapters were being passed around to the other members. How it works, there is a solution, and people would take their turn reading it and come back and say, wow, can we, can we lose this word? Or can we change this sentence to X? Or is this really necessary? And this was sort of happening in a rather methodical, uh, one would hope, reasonable way. Then, when the deadline date came for publishing, they needed to get this all together and ready to be published rather rapidly. In the course of doing that, there is one page in the entire book that has never been able to be accounted for by anyone, including Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith, who've spoken about this publicly. Nobody knows exactly why page 65 was put in there. Point being, there was a couple of different ways that they had to do fourth, step, fourth steps in those days. And they knew that because most people, because most people lived where there weren't meetings, would be sending away for this book <clears throat> and perhaps working these steps with a psychologist or a member of the clergy. They wanted to have some kind of example in the book on a way to do the fourth step. No one really knows why this one was put in, considering 
that there's no archives available for AA, and I mean, there's many archives available, but there are none that show this particular method being used in those early meetings that we know of, specifically until about the mid to late 60s. Okay, what they were using predominantly in these meetings is what we've passed out to you, which is what's called an assets and liabilities checklist, or a moral inventory. Does anybody need one of these who doesn't have one? Because there's a bunch of them on the tables. Okay, so this is what we're going to go through with you, as this is what Dr. Bob and others of the first 100 were using in the early days. Um, there are two reasons, and this is just my own experience now, there are two reasons that I prefer this method. The first one is that it's quite simple. It's quite simple to use this. And I don't actually find the assets and liabilities list, uh, excuse me, uh, the uh, column inventory all that simple. Some do. Many people do. And nobody is saying you shouldn't use it. I would offer that over the years, I have had hundreds of phone calls from guys in the middle of their fourth step who call me and say, you know, there was this thing that happened with this person. I, I want to write it down. Uh, but then, like, so the part of how it made me feel is going to go in the second column, and then I don't, what goes in the third column? And is this a resentment, or is this a fear, or is it both? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? So, for some people, this is a perfect method. Although my experience has been that it's difficult enough to take an alcoholic or an addict and bring them to the threshold where they're ready to give up all their secrets, all their most shameful stuff. But one thing I don't want to do is make it difficult for them to pull that off. I don't want to confuse them. The nice thing about this moral inventory is it's a check mark system. So it's remarkably simple. The other thing I like about this inventory is that it's going to deal with our resentments, our fears, and our harms done others on one grid. So we're not making separate lists. So I'm going to demonstrate to you very quickly how this would work. Okay? The first thing you do, because you have a blank in front of you, so if you actually wanted to do a moral inventory in this way, the first thing you're going to do is find yourself a copy machine and make the appropriate amount of copies, or basically what you think the appropriate amount of copies would be. I don't mean this judgmentally, but chances are if you can do this on one page, you're probably lying or 11 years old. So chances are you'll need some copies. Whether you need six or 60 will be about your history and your situation and what you think is going to be appropriate. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the first page, and at the beginning, all we're dealing with are the boxes at the top that are on an angle. Does everybody see that? Okay. And what's happening with these boxes across the top is we are going to write into the blanks the name of any person, place, or thing, or situation that we have a resentment with, that we are scared of, or that we've caused harm to. Okay. Now let's be clear. There are certain people or places that may fall into all three categories. Right? As an example, let's say your father. Right? It's very possible that you have resentments with your father, that you are scared of your father, and that you've caused harm to your father. For the moment, all that matters is that in this first slanty box, you write, Dad. That's it. Right? And then in the second box, potentially, Mom. And then sister, brother, Uncle Jim, Aunt Ethel, my neighbor, my workplace, the workplace I was in before this workplace, my boss, the boss I had before that boss, the boss I had before that boss. Next page, my neighbor, uh, the Chicago Police Department, uh, the New York High School that I went to, uh, the, the neighborhood I grew up in, uh, the neighbor who beat me up, and on and on it goes. Filling pages, simply just the blanks across the top, anybody we can think of that we resent, fear, or have hurt, or two or three of them. Does anybody not grasp what I'm saying? Anybody have any questions about that part? Please, Bell. There's no separation. You just go. There's no separation. Right now, you're just making a comprehensive list of all the people who need to be on this fourth step. 
And this is back as far as you can remember. Uh, it's a very good question. For your resentments and your harms done others, yes, we're going back as far as we can remember to our earliest memories. What if they're dead? It's fine. Absolutely fine. Yeah. Dead people, living people, all of it. The only, uh, the only element you're not going all the way back through your life with are your fears. Why is that? Because your, your fears were navigating your current fears. The idea being, if you had a resentment with a third grade teacher who shamed you in front of all your fellow third grade students, that would be fodder for your resentment list. If you were scared of the dark in third grade, it doesn't really need to be written down unless you're currently scared of the dark, right? Which would be applicable. So the fears that are current need to be on here. We don't really need to have conversations about what we were scared of, but what we are scared of. But in terms of what we resent and whom we've hurt, yeah, that goes all the way back. And incidentally, going back to, to Bell's question, if you want to make a bunch of copies and take three or four blanks for your resentments, three or four blanks for your fears, and three or four blanks for your harms done others, you can do that. You just don't need to. Because what's going to happen, once you've got all your blanks filled in, you're going to go back to the first page and start filling in the data for each person. So with dad, who was, again, our first blank, right? you'll notice there are these words down the side. Resentment, fear, selfishness, dishonesty, false pride, jealousy, envy, laziness. So from here on in, it's basically a check mark system. So if you have resentments with your father under dad, you're going to check resentment. If you're scared of dad, you're going to check fear. And if you've hurt dad in some way, you're going to check selfishness, dishonesty, false pride, jealousy, envy, laziness, or whichever two or three or four are applicable to the way in which you harmed your father. Right? So the first word, resentment, covers resentment. The second word, fear, covers fear. The rest of the words are about harms done other. Right? From here on in, we're just making check marks. When you're done doing that, you're done with your fourth step. Yes? Why are the assets there? It's a very good question. The, the words on the other side, the assets list, you will find correspond directly to the character defects across from them. So they're there mainly for reference. The idea being, as you're starting to, you know, if you find you have a ton of check marks under dishonesty and you look across, you're going to find out you need to be working on honesty. So now you have a sense of what you need to create less of and what you need to create more of. Right? So with something like honesty and dishonesty, that may be quite simple. Although for a lot of people, jealousy and envy are the same word. A lot of people process jealousy and envy as the same word. They're not the same word. And you'll notice that if you have a lot of jealousy, you need to be working on trust. If you have a lot of envy, you need to be working on contentment. So that's the utility to the assets list. Okay. So once you've got all your check marks, you're ready to sit down for your fifth step. The details of what those check marks represent will get dealt with in the fifth step. Right? So obviously, me just checking resentment for dad probably isn't going to cover it. There's obviously resentments I have specifically with dad and what dad did. There may be some specific stories about dad harming me or being unkind to me or not showing up to me that I need to process. But that's all fifth step stuff or can be. So if you want to write all those stories about dad in advance, you can. But ultimately, I sit down with a sponsee and I say, OK, so dad's here first. Uh, what's your resentment with dad? And the sponsee says, well, first of all, he left mom when I was nine. Wow. And how did that make you feel? Um, abandoned, sad, angry. Wow, how do you think that affected your life? And then we process. Right? So the point about the fourth step is it's essentially a cheat sheet for the fifth step. The bulk of the work is done in five, not in four. All I'm doing is four is getting all the information down on paper, sort of the cliffs notes of what I need to talk about in five with the person I do five with. Questions about that, please. You do not need to do the, the fourth step with your sponsor. You don't need to. You can so in the early days of AA, it was actually very commonplace, 
It says very clearly in the book, it all needs to be on paper. They say that endlessly in the chapter, right? Uh, but in the early days of AA, what was very commonplace would be for the sponsor to sit down with the sponsee and do four and five as a unit, i.e. we'd start to talk about it and write it down as we talked about it. And in many cases in those early days, it was the sponsor who did the writing because most of those early guys in AA couldn't stop shaking and were not capable of writing. So the idea of doing four and five as a unit with your sponsor is perfectly appropriate. The idea of doing it on your own and then bringing it to a sponsor, which is more commonplace these days, also perfectly appropriate. Other questions about four? Anything? OK, I did say a few minutes ago that the key to four is not the method you use. Here's the key to four. The key to four is that you not lie and that you not purposely or consciously leave information off. Okay, and that's what most people try to do. My guess is that everybody in this room, at least those of you who have not done a fourth and fifth step, have at least one thing that's happened to you or one thing you've thought or one thing you've done, some shameful, horrid, yucky, awful, buried piece of information that you were absolutely bringing to your grave with and if you told me, you'd have to kill me. Right? At least one. I mean, I had about eight of those. Right? The bottom line is that you could fill up 77 pages chock full of check marks, but then decide, I'm not writing that one down. Go set a bonfire to the rest of it, because you've wasted your time. And I promise you that that's true. And it is not because everybody or anybody in AA is desperate to know all your deep, dark, dirty secrets. Because the reality is, and I say this with nothing but love, you're not that interesting. <laughs> your damage is not as interesting as you think it is. And it's definitely not as original as you think it is. If there's a name for it, you didn't invent it, right? But it's inside of you, corroding you from the inside. And the truth, the truth is, the deeper it is and the uglier it is, the more of a part it's been playing in your falling apart. <clears throat> Questions about that? I had just one question. Please. As you're writing your list and you're checking it off, Uh-huh. Is there anywhere in the big book where it says you should start writing down exactly what you resent or what your selfishness is towards mm -hmm. the person, or is it just a check mark to see what you're going to work on your assets? Um, it doesn't get into that specifically, exactly how you're supposed to do it. Like I said, they give you a suggestion on 65 that involves a little bit more writing. Again, not really indicative of what was going on in the early days. Um, so, no, that's really up to you. If you are some, I mean, I, I've had sponsees. Um, I had a sponsor who was an author. And to do this, he really felt like to process this in advance, I really need to write. That's fine. I mean, write a book if that's useful to you. <coughs> right? Well, the reason why I ask is because I don't want to move ahead of you, but on step five, as it says, admit to God to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrong. Another human being, I mean, that's only one person, another human being. That's right. So I'm going to sit down in the fifth step with another human being, with myself and God, and another human being, right, and give it all up. All the data that's in these pages, I'm going to give to one human being. That's really the key here. Which is your sponsor. Which, or it could be someone else. Exactly. In most cases these days, it is your sponsor, and I'll cover that as we get into five. It's up to you who it is. But I can certainly tell you from my own experience, the thing about me was nobody knew the whole story about Michael. Nobody. You probably knew some of it. You knew some of it. Maybe you knew a lot of it. <laughs> Nobody knew all of it. But you. But me. Exactly. And interestingly, since you bring that up, something I often say in meetings, and I, 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 I have found this has some merit, something I often used to say to myself, actually all the time, is nobody will know. Absolutely. Right? Nobody will know. I mean, I know I'm dating her, but <laughs> this one lives all across town. Nobody, nobody's going to know. You know, I know this, this, this pack of gum costs $1.20, but look how little it is, and it just fits right in my body. I mean, nobody will know. He used to say it all the time, right? Now, what this gentleman just said is, I knew, 
Certainly I knew. So it seems to me if both of those things were functioning as true, nobody knows, I know, and obviously I was what? Nobody. I was nobody. I didn't count in the equation. If I was the only person who knew something, nobody knew. Today, the reason I can't get away with anything anymore is because somebody always knows. I've done this work, and today I count. So even if you and you and you are not watching me, I'm watching me. You know, i got to tell you, I'd love to sit up here on a pedestal and tell you that the reason that I don't lie and cheat and steal and fight, etc., anymore has something to do with nobility or altruism, but the reality is I can't do it anymore. I can't get away with it anymore. Literally. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, please. It's true that many people have done more than one four step. Yes. Uh, if, is this meant to be a superficial, quicker way to get through with this in a week to get to step nine as quickly as possible to relieve the obsession? Or are we um, eventually going to use this format again at a later time? Or are we going to do step 10, which is a condensed four through nine? Is okay, that's a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a nice basket of questions. I, and they're all good ones, don't get me wrong. Uh, the, only thing, the only thing I wouldn't adhere to <coughs> what you just said is the word superficial. I don't think it's superficial. Fundamental. Um, fundamental is great, absolutely, yes. So uh, I, I think the point, and, and you'll let me know if this is the case, I think the point that's being made here is there's, there's no such thing as a complete first, fourth step in that not everything's gonna be down there because you're just not gonna remember everything. You're not. Your truth will disclose itself to you over time. Um, and most people, most people over the course of recovery do more than one fourth step. You don't have to. I've probably done five or six formal fourth steps because my truth continued to disclose itself. So the only stuff you need to worry about is the stuff you choose to leave off, not the stuff you forget. And yes, um, this list is going to have further utility down the road which we will talk about next session. Um, and yes, there is going to be a step down the road that will be the equivalent of a daily fourth step, which we'll actually talk about in two weeks. But it says on page 75 that we have to illuminate, illuminate, illuminate every dark cranny of the past. Uh-huh. As we understand it. I can only illuminate what I'm aware is there. Right? It's only possible for me to shine a light on something that I know needs shining a light on. So the stuff that isn't in my conscious mind, the stuff that I have failed to remember, it just can't be dealt with right now. There will be an opportunity to. So every dark cranny of the past that I'm aware took place, which in all of us is probably going to be limited the first time around. Thank you. Great questions. Um, so once we've done this to the best of our ability, that's going to take us into the fifth step where, as the gentleman said over here, we're going to admit to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. The principle of the fifth step is integrity. <coughs> integrity. Okay. Also, pay attention to the idea of the exact nature of our wrongs. That's a, that's a little bit more extensive than our wrongs. Right? For example, previous to my wife, I engaged in a lot of infidelity when it came to intimate relationships. Not proud of it, but it's true. If you asked me, what was the exact nature of the wrong? The best I probably could have come up with was dishonesty, selfishness. Probably the best I could come up with. And those actions were dishonest. And they were selfish. Although I would offer the exact nature of those actions, of those infidelities, were fear. They were fear. My infidelities were never about sex. Never. It was always about the fact that I had no idea how to trust you loving me. And I, I needed to have somebody else on layaway because, God forbid, I shouldn't have someone around to fill me up with the information that I was okay. I was sort of like an orange juice glass with a little crack at the bottom, 
right? No matter how much orange juice you pour in, it's always in the process of dribbling out. And I needed it constantly poured in, right? It took me a while to really grasp that. So that's part of what we're looking at here in the fifth step. We're going to find out about the exact nature of our wrongs. Um, the chapter called Into Action, page 72, top of that page. And this is where the fifth step begins, right? It says... Having made our personal inventory, that's what we did in four, what shall we do about it? What do I do with this, this paperwork I now have? We've been trying to get a new attitude and a new relationship with our creator and to discover the obstacles in our path. Remember, causes and conditions. The <laughs> obstacles in our path, what's blocking me from God. We've admitted certain defects. We've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We've put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory, so it's reviewing for us the work we've done so far. Now, these are about to be cast out. That's the key to a fifth step. These are about to be cast out. If I can use a semi-disgusting metaphor for a moment, and because this is a room full of drunks, <laughs> I imagine you'll be okay with this. The metaphor of throwing up, do you ever have the experience of being in a bar? You've had one drink too many. You know that because all of a sudden you desperately need to throw up. And yet you also realize it's just not time to throw up yet. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's right here. But it's not coming yet. It's just not ready. How uncomfortable that feeling is. Right? This is almost the equivalent of us having lived our whole lives that way with our character defects right there. Right? Now think about on that night when you finally do throw up, the actual act of throwing up, not pleasant, not pleasant, not fun, neither is the act of doing a fifth step in most cases. Not pleasant, not necessarily fun. Then, once you've gotten back up on your feet from throwing up and you clean yourself up and have a breath mint, what's the main feeling? Relief. Relief. <laughs> That's sort of what the back end of a fifth step looks like, right? So this is all about to be cast out. All this stuff that's been inside of me corroding my insides, right? I'm about to vomit up all that poison. Okay, so that's really what's going on in the fifth step. Now here's something really interesting. I'm going to ask you to count for a moment. Please bear with me. Go to the bottom of page 72 and count four lines up and then in the middle of the line it says time after time. Everybody see that? Yes. Time after time? Okay. So they're about to give us some data about what they've experienced. Now remember, this book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is not theoretical. It's experiential. Right? This had been going on for about five years before they put it down on paper, before the book came out. So they're not telling you what they think. They're telling you what they've watched, what they know. So they're about to tell us about what happens for the people who came in and tried to leave one or two facts off a fourth set, right? Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives, right? Time after time, this hasn't happened three times, time after time, right? Trying to avoid this humbling experience. <laughs> We're in the process of trying to gain in humility, which is the polar opposite of pride and ego. They have tried to turn to easier methods, i.e. they've tried to leave something off their fourth step and sort of get away with it, if you will. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Almost every single time that someone has tried to pull that off, they went back out. That's what we've watched. Having persevered with the rest of the program, which means these people didn't necessarily leave something off their fourth step, not own it in their fifth step, and drink. Some of them persevered with the rest of the program, right? So they left something off one and you know off their uh, fourth and fifth step, and then went on to step six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Going to meetings, sponsoring people, GSR for their district, you know, some kind of doing it all. Then they wondered why they fell. What happened? Right? I've heard this again and again and again. Four and a half years sober, all of a sudden I had a drink in my hand. I didn't see it coming. I don't know what happened. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. Right? I hear that all the time. We think the reason 
We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. The theory they're offering and the data they have to offer it is all these people who went back out and drank, is that these people never completed their house cleaning. They hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought italics. They had lost their egoism and fear. They only thought they had humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. Therefore, they're saying, we have seen person after person after person come in, put together a bunch of time, and then all of a sudden go back out there and come to the conclusion that what got them back out there was that one piece of information they left off their fourth step or didn't admit to in their fifth step. Okay, uh, Real quick, into action, page 75, first paragraph. The gentleman over here brought uh, up a point when we were uh, still in the fourth step that the book is now going to speak to. When we decide who is to hear our story, did everyone catch that? Mm -hmm. So who decides who hears your fourth step? We do. We do. You do. It's up to you, right? There's no automatic you use your sponsor. We have a written inventory. We're prepared for a long talk. Right? So sitting down to do your fourth step might take a little while. We explain to our partner what we are about to do and why we have to do it. That person who you're going to do it with should realize that you're engaged upon a life and death errand, that this is a big deal. Most people approached in this way will be glad to help. They'll be honored by our confidence. Yes, these days most people use their sponsors. I think there are some specific upsides to using your sponsor or someone else in the program. One of those upsides being that they've probably done this themselves. And if by any chance you have a sponsor who hasn't done this themselves, for the love of God, get another sponsor. <laughs> as quickly as humanly possible, okay? But back in the early days, you know, unless you lived in Cleveland or Akron or New York or one of the handful of places they originally had meetings, most people used a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a priest, a rabbi, a member of the clergy, or even a friend. It's still up to you. You use whoever you want to use. To do this correctly, though, you do need to tell the whole story to one person. So what you don't get to do is split it up. Right? You don't get to tell your sponsor 60% of it, your psychologist 20% of it, and then you know, the rest of it to your therapist. You can do that, uh, but history shows it's not going to work for you. And let's face it, that's indicative of what we've done our whole lives, is not give anyone the whole story. So that's fairly important. Um, questions so far about five? Please. Um, like I've listened to like some of the Joe and Charlie tapes. Joe and Charlie, yeah. And, um, the claim that they've made is that this like one paragraph where they talk about that is probably, in their opinion, the only part of the book that's outdated today. Meaning? Meaning that you um, probably should use your sponsor as opposed to searching for... Oh. Like I, in my case specifically, like when I was looking to do my fifth step, mm -hmm. I wanted to do it with a priest for the simple fact that I didn't care what those people had to say. Okay. And um, other people might fall into that same trap. Okay, so I would offer you a couple of things. One, I agree that it's outdated in the, in the, in the sense that the, the community's changed. We've grown enormously, right? So there, there's very little reason anybody couldn't do this with a sponsor at this point. So yes, I, th I, I totally adhere to Joe and Charlie as far as that goes. The other thing, though, is you said the reason that you were looking for a priest is because you didn't care what they said. That speaks to motive, right? So you might want to check your motives. Um, Again, there's nothing wrong, you know, again, according, there's nothing wrong with not using a sponsor in that I, I could introduce you to a couple of people I know who did their initial fourth step with a member of the clergy and had a remarkable life-changing experience and got everything they needed from the fourth and fifth step, okay? But I would also offer that they were people who either A, had a relationship with that member of the clergy in which there was huge trust and the idea that that's really, you know, that felt very true to their hearts. Or they decided that, for, you know, maybe there was one or two pieces of information uh, uh, that had to do with, like, illegality or something where they thought it was really important that they uh, deal with someone who had actually taken an oath to keep their trust rather than someone in AA who's just sort of made the promise to keep your trust. That seems okay, too. So I, I don't say that in deference to what you're saying. 
I agree with the idea that for the most part it's outdated, but still reasonable. But I think the idea of checking your motives for why to do it is probably always useful. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. Okay, terrific. Please. Is every twist of character dark, uh, no and cranny necessarily a resentment, fear, or harm? Um, the idea is that if you write down all of those <laughs> things, you're pretty much going to take care of everything in your life that's not processed or dealt with. That's the idea. Yes. Uh, so, which is a perfect lead into our fifth step promises. Right? This comes back to the idea that there is something we often read at the beginning of AA meetings that we call the promises. Um, the idea, they're the ninth step promises. They're not the promises. Um, it's not bad that you know they sort of got this de facto promotion to be the promises, except that it can often give newcomers the idea that those are our only promises, when in fact there are promises strewn throughout this book, associated with just about every step. Here's the fifth step promises. Um, uh, page 75, second paragraph. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. If we do that, here's what we can expect to happen. Once we have taken this step, withholding nothing. We are delighted. You can expect to be delighted. We can look the world in the eye. So if you're someone who knows what it is to not always be able to look the world in the eye, you can start to expect to actually go out into your life not being led around by shame and by guilt. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. That's a nice promise. Right? If you know what it is to not really be able to sit in serenity, this is when we can start to expect that to happen. Our fears start to fall away from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but we now begin to have a spiritual experience. This speaks to the idea between a belief in God and a relationship with God. Right? A belief in God won't get you well. Not if you're an alcoholic or a drug addict. <laughs> I believed in God and smoked crack all at the same time. <laughs> Always believed in God. Yes. Didn't do anything for me. Why? Because a belief in God is nothing but an idea. It's just an idea. As an example, I'm a life coach. That's what I do for a living. I always offer a free consultation if someone's interested in working with me. So let's say someone comes in and we do a consultation. And when they leave, they get in their car, they're driving home, and they think to themselves, I believe in Michael Mark. I really believe this, this is a competent man. I really believe this is someone who could help me. But you never actually come and do any work with me? I don't see how I could help you. I don't see how your belief in me is going to get you anywhere. If you actually come and create a relationship with me, I might actually be able to be of use to you. God's the same way. Believing God exists is just a concept. It's not going to change your life. A relationship with God, which is what these steps are about, will fundamentally change the way you experience yourself, others, and your relationship with a higher power. The feeling that the drink problem, now we're going to get a warning. I talked about warnings before. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. That's also a promise. It's a warning in that they're telling you this is the point at which you may actually start to feel that the problem has been removed. That's a nice feeling to start to have. Just be clear, it hasn't been removed. That's not going to happen until we move from step 9 into steps 10, 11, and 12. So go ahead and enjoy the feeling of maybe not having to sit on your hands every second to stay away from a drink. But don't mistake that for the idea that the problem's been removed because there is still work to be done. Finally, we feel we are on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Okay, those are our fifth step promises. Finally, if you look at the last paragraph on page 75, the third paragraph, we're going to find out the directions for what we do when our fifth step's complete. Right? So what's the first thing the book's going to tell us? Where do you go when your fifth step's complete? Home. 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 Returning home. Right? So if you go to your sponsor's house to do your fifth step, knowing that you have a dinner party planned afterwards, that's not really going to work. Don't do your fifth step if you have to go straight to work. <coughs> You're going to need to return home. When you return home, we find a place we can be quiet for an hour. So you need to not only go home, but set aside 60 minutes. 
that you're going to need to spend with self and with God. In that 60 minutes, we may just sit quietly, we may meditate, we may prayer, uh, we, may, we may pray, right? But one thing we're definitely going to need to do is carefully reviewing, we're going to review what we have done. We're going to thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better, so perhaps we're going to say a quick prayer. Taking this book down from the shelf, so we're going to have our big book handy, we're going to turn to the page which contains the 12 steps, that's the beginning of chapter 5, how it works, right? And we're going to carefully read the first five proposals, the first five steps, asking if we've omitted anything. Have we? So this is the point at which you're going to ask yourself, has my work been complete? If it hasn't been, if, if you realize or, or get honest about the idea that you left something off four or didn't admit to something in five, you're not bad, you're not wrong. It's not, the idea is not to shame yourself. But they're saying now's the time to clean it up. They're warning you don't go into the latter half of the steps with a shaky foundation from the first half. That's not going to work out well for you. Consequently, I've gotten endless calls at 2 o'clock in the morning after doing a fifth step that very evening with a guy. You know, the phone rings 2 in the morning, and I sleepily pick it up and go, hello, and this is what I hear. <laughs> There's something I didn't tell you. <laughs> to which I tend to respond, awesome. Tell me, why is it awesome? It's awesome because in most cases, this is a guy who six months before could be wildly inappropriate and hurtful and not even feel it. And this cat couldn't sleep because he left something off his fifth step. Left something off his fourth step, didn't tell me something in his fifth step. That's fabulous. That's God working in his life. That's what begins to happen once we begin to work, which is what we've started up here in four and five. Next session, we're going to talk about now that this information's all been coughed up, if you will, what do we do with it? What are we going to do with this information we've now got our hands around and come to understand something about? So in the next session, we're going to go over steps six and seven, which will complete the taking, ourselves, uh, taking care of ourselves part of the work, and eight and nine, which is the place in which we start to deal with others. For tonight, I don't want to hold you hostage. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we got a nice way to close. Let's circle up. Mm -hmm.